As far as integration and end-to-end user experience goes, Apple has always been one of the companies that pushed hard on that subject. This led to some pretty nice features such as continuity, airplay and airdrop. But before you can get this up and running, you need to get a crucial part of your Hackintosh up and running and right. Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. In this video of my Hackintosh build guide series, I will walk you through the steps of how to get your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth working on your Hackintosh. Before we actually get to the building part, let's examine why Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is so tricky with Hackintoshes. Most motherboards with built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chips use PCIe modules, which they source from various vendors or produce themselves like ASUS for example. A rare occasion is the usage of modules by Broadcom, which are used throughout the whole Mac lineup since years. And as Macs ever since use Broadcom modules, you have to deal with the incompatibilities of other brands and Wi-Fi modules. But what can we do to solve the problem? You can order Mac compatible Wi-Fi modules off the internet as I did for example on eBay. I opted for two different chips to show you two different approaches, as already described in the intro. Two different chips, that means first route will utilize one of the unused PCIe slots on the motherboard to install the second Wi-Fi card. The second route will incorporate quite a bit of work and you will replace the existing Wi-Fi chip on the motherboard and download and copy some kegs to your AFI folder, but bear in mind the route 2 works for my motherboard but maybe not for yours. So check your hardware first before going down this path. A short spoiler, I heavily recommend going the first route because even though you have maybe the same motherboard as me, there is still a lot of work to do, but more on that later. Before we add our Broadcom chip to the build, we have to take care of two things. First of all, we need to deactivate SIP. SIP stands for System Integrity Protection and it protects the operating system and files from unwanted access of third parties. If you are doing changes to your system, be it new CACs or changes in your hardware configuration, you need to deactivate this. Otherwise, your system may not boot up after your changes. Open Clever Configurator and mount the EFI folder of your macOS installation drive. Go to the RT Variables section and set the CSR Active Config to 0x67. The hex value 0x67 is deactivating SIP completely. Ok, so let's start with Route 1. My Broadcom kit got shipped with a PCIe adapter card. The Broadcom BCM94360 CD chip from a 2013 iMac, a 2 pin to 8 pin adapter cable to connect the Bluetooth module to the USB port on the main board, and of course the antennas and two safety screws. In comparison to the onboard ASUS Wi-Fi module, this Broadcom card needs 4 antennas to work properly. That's why we are using the extra adapter card with 4 antennas. The onboard slot would provide just 2. It cost me around 65 euro including shipping and I ordered it directly from a Hong Kong based reseller on eBay. First of all you need to screw the chip onto the PCIe card. Take the PCIe adapter card and push the Broadcom chip with an angle of roughly 30 degrees into the slot and secure the chip with the two small screws. Afterwards push the antenna extension cable into the plugs on the Wi-Fi chip. The order is not important. Three antennas will be used for Wi-Fi and one for Bluetooth. Next plug in the 2 pin to 8 pin USB adapter cable which will connect the Bluetooth chip with the USB 2.0 port on the mainboard. Now it's time to put the card into your system. Gently push the card into the PCIe X1 slot and secure it with a screw. You can install this card on any PCIe X1 slot. I chose to install mine on the slot between the graphics card and the CPU socket itself. The card doesn't need much space and doesn't generate any heat. So it fits perfectly and I also have all the other PCIe slots available for other upgrades. Another benefit is that the antennas are not blocking the HDMI and display ports of the GPU. On other main boards, the PCIe layout can be a bit different, but the same principles apply. Don't forget to connect the card with the USB port. The orientation of the cable can be a bit tricky. 
If your system is showing Wi-Fi but no Bluetooth, then you have to rotate the connector by 180 degrees. Here is a close-up of the orientation which worked for me. Also don't forget to screw on the antennas and you are already done. As I also used the built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth adapter for my Windows 10 installation, I also screwed in the second antenna which came with my mainboard. The first route was to build in an additional Wi-Fi module. Instead of that, let's now replace the already existing built-on Wi-Fi module by and ASUS Go the second route. By default, my mainboard features a for macOS incompatible Wi-Fi module by ASUS. This time, we use a smaller module, the Broadcom BCM94352Z. I ordered the Dell version of this Wi-Fi module, which is known to work with macOS. I got it from a guy of a Craigslist-like German website. It's a bit slower, as it's just featuring 867 Mbits versus the 1300 Mbits on the iMac card. But it should be fast enough for most people. To install the chip, you first of all need to deconstruct the I.O. shield. You need to first detach the plastic top that is covering the I.O. shield. Unscrew three screws on the back side of the motherboard. Switch back to the front, lift the plastic cover slightly and gently detach the cable for the RGB lights of the I.O. shield. In the second step, you need to loose the two clamps that hold the I.O. shield in place. After the clamps are detached, pull the I.O. shield off the mainboard. The Wi-Fi module itself is hidden within an own case. To get it off, we have to lose two additional screws on the backside of the motherboard. Pull out the case, including the module, and now you can clearly see how this Wi-Fi module is held in place and where we have to insert our replacement module. To open the metal housing, loose an additional screw and then lift the cover plate of the module. It's a bit finicky, as it's secured by the label on the backside. After you've opened the housing, unscrew the securing screw and detach the antenna cables. After that, pull the Wi-Fi module out of the case. Maybe you need to apply some force because it's glued in with a foam to hold it in place. Peel the foam of the Wi-Fi module and place it back into the housing. After that, attach the antenna cables with the new chip. I did that first because it was way easier this way. Put the card afterwards into the housing and you need to do this as accurate as possible. Otherwise the card won't fit back into the slot. Secure it with the screw and put back the metal cover and don't forget the additional security screw.
Now put the Wi-Fi card back into the PCIe slot and secure it on the back side with the two screws. The module should sit now snug fit on the mainboard. When you have done that, you have to reinstall the I.O. shield by gently pushing it onto the I.O. slots. Work with minimal force and apply constant pressure. After that, put the clamps back on to secure the I.O. shield. Gently attach the RGB cable and screw on the plastic cover for the I.O. shield. If you are using Windows 10, you have to search and install new drivers for your Broadcom module. I have linked the wiki website below. There you can find the latest drivers for this module. To get this fully work on a macOS, some Broadcom modules like this one need some additional steps compared to the module of Road 1. First download the most recent version of Reapman's OS X fake PCI ID, linked below in the description. Also download the most recent version of Reapman's OS X BRCM patch RAM. Unzip it and copy the fake PCI ID text and the fake PCI ID Broadcom Wi-Fi text into the folder efi slash clover slash kext slash other and copy the BRCM firmware data dot kext BRCM patch ram 2.kext and BRCM non patch ram 2.kext into the EFI slash clover slash kext slash other folder. If problems occur with either Wi Fi or Bluetooth not working, you can try the following. Move the BRCM patch ram 2.kext and the BRCM non patch ram 2.kext to library slash extensions on your installation drive. Delete the BRCM firmware data.kext from EFI clever kext other folder and copy from the release folder, so the folder you unzipped earlier, the BRCM firmware repo.kext to the library extensions folder. There can still occur problems with some versions of Broadcom chips. Maybe continuity or airdrop is not working, so I heavily recommend using the natively supported Broadcom chips listed in the Tony Mac X Bluetooth and Wi-Fi guide linked in the description, or just use the module of Route 1. And note that the CACs are just necessary for the second and not the first route. Let's get to a conclusion on the topic and the two routes. What worked? The Apple wireless keyboard also worked in Clever because of its HID interface. So no need to connect the USB keyboard even though I use a wireless Logitech mouse to select the OS I want to boot. Bluetooth mice and other Bluetooth keyboards with both Windows and Mac are working and the pairing of an iPhone via Bluetooth and Wi-Fi including all those features that come with the Apple ecosystem worked for me. The benefits of the first route are less effort of upgrading the system and faster Wi-Fi. You can also use a second Wi-Fi module for Windows 10, which is still a built-in. So the downside on this routes are less obvious, but you have two Bluetooth chips, which can be a bit finicky to get to work with one Bluetooth keyboard, for example. I use the keyboard, which can switch, for example, between three different Bluetooth devices. And yeah, on the downside, an extra adapter card and the faster Broadcom chip will cost you a bit more money. For me, it was roughly an extra 30 to 40 euros. The benefits of the second route are that one more PCIe slot is at your disposal and it's also an integrated solution at a lower price. The downsides are slower Wi-Fi, maybe also a little less reach of the Wi-Fi because of just two antennas for both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and you will also have to tear apart the whole I.O. shield of the motherboard, which can also take quite a bit of time. And most important you need to download additional CACs, so kernel extensions and maintain and update them from time to time. Same with Windows 10 on a dual boot system where you need to find the driver for the new Wi-Fi chip, which is not that easy. And the second route was overall way more work as the first route. That's why I would always decide to go the first route if I would have to make a choice again. And to be honest, for me Wi-Fi was not important at all because I use my machine via LAN. 
which is more reliable and usually also faster. But Bluetooth was important because of the Apple keyboard, which I still like the most of all those Bluetooth keyboards, and I wanted to have the chance to use all the Apple features like continuity, enhance of for iMessage and FaceTime, AirDrop and AirPlay later on if I would maybe switch to the iOS ecosystem. Which led me directly to the topic of the next video, where I will show you how to get all this up and running, so meaning iMessage, FaceTime, Continuity, AirDrop and AirPlay, and how to resolve issues. I originally wanted to cover it in this video here, but yeah, you see it's already very long. So drop me a comment below about your experiences with getting Wi-Fi and Bluetooth to work on your Hackintosh, and I would appreciate this a lot, and sure not just me, also others. So. Thanks for watching, happy hacking and see you in the next video. Peace!